Ja, meine... Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, friends of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, dear guests. It's summer in the city, and the Heinrich Böll Foundation uh, has a large crowd. We are very happy to welcome you to a very special evening. I would like to welcome first and foremost our special guest, uh, Jim, um, Tim Jackson, the author of Prosperity Without Growth. Tim Jackson. Well, I don't think there's a need to introduce Tim Jackson. He's going to give a presentation in a couple of minutes. Tim Jackson is a professor for sustainable development at the at Surrey University in the UK, and he's also the director of uh, the Center for Understanding Sustainable Prosperity. For seven years, uh, Tim Jackson has worked for the Sustainable Development Commission in the UK. The work of that commission was then the foundation for his first book, Prosperity Without um, Growth. The book was published in 2009, so eight years ago. We as the Heinrich Böll Foundation have soon decided after the English edition came out to have this book translated, Wohlstand ohne Wachstum, that's the title of that book. And I must say it was and it is the most popular book that we have ever published with the Ökom uh, Publishing House. And uh, we already have published a number of editions. Uh, editions. It's wonderful to have such a good feedback and resonance, uh, not just in Germany, the uh, book Prosperity Without Growth by J Tim Jackson has triggered huge responses all around the world. It was translated into a number of languages, and the reason for that is simple. Tim Jackson touched a very important topic, and uh, that resonates with many people, many of you of course, will agree with me that ever since the financial crisis 2008, and since we have climate change and um, a, a use of excessive use of resources and social e inequality everywhere, not just at home, but especially in the global south, and many people have started thinking about whether the economic model that we currently have and whether the way in which we consume is the way to go forward to keep the world safe for our children and grandchildren. This book, Prosperity Without Growth, deals with all these issues. And it's one of the few books that uh, explores this topic substantially and thinks about how we can guarantee prosperity without growth. That's not a trivial issue at all. Tim Jackson. now wrote an update because he got so many responses from his readership. So what he did is not re-edit his book. He has revised this book, re-edited it, and it now includes uh, current data and things into the future. And once again, explores the issue how to achieve growth without, uh, how to achieve prosperity without growth. I am now going to start uh, together with uh, Tim Jackson to introduce the most important aspects of this book in the course of the next half hour. And afterwards, I would like to hand over to Andreas Novi. He comes from Austria, from Vienna. He's our second guest, and he's going to join us on stage. I'm going to introduce you, Andreas, in a minute. Now, after this introduction of the book, we are going to have a panel discussion right on stage, and later, of course, we're going to open the floor for you as well. Uh, there is one person uh, missing, Sunitana Ryan, from the uh, Center for Science and in Environment, New Delhi, a partner of the Henry Böll Foundation. Sunita was looking forward to this debate and wanted to participate in this discussion. She would have been the one to 
bring the Indian perspective, the Southern perspective into our discussion. She wanted to talk about her perception of uh, prosperity and growth from an India perspective. Sunita had to cancel her participation because her organization has uh, sued uh, the uh, Indian government because of uh, Petco and uh, the uh, oral hearing in the Supreme Court takes place today and tomorrow. That is why she couldn't come here. It is, uh, of course, wonderful to have organizations such as the Center for Science and uh, the Environment that are courageous enough also to sue governments or major corporations for their water pollution and uh, resource abuse. We would like to wish Sunita all the best for her lawsuit because we see that uh, it is a very important also for environmental organizations uh, to bring global corporations to justice so that they stop polluting and contaminating our environment. We wish Sunita the best of success. All right. Now, it is my pleasure to start my conversation with Tim. As I said, we'd like to have a dialogue. What you're going to see on the screen right now are a number of quotation quotations from the German edition of Tim's book. We have picked four quotations that we consider very important in order to understand the content of this book. Of course, Tim knows well, the things we will show on screen now. And our questions, our Q&A, our discussion, our dialogue is going to deal with the issues that you can read on the screen. As I said, the book was, was published in 2009, the first book. It was a milestone for the debate about sustainability and our ability to secure the f future. This book, in a very fundamental way, has addressed the eternal answer of economists. How do we want to live? How do we want to work? What do we do about crisis? And uh, the eternal answer to all these questions has have always been exponential growth. And this book looks at growth this obsessive growth paradigm. And mainstream economists have uh, also looked at this book. And my first question to you, Tim, is what was your motivation to write this book? And why did you decide to write an update? And what's new in that updated book? Uh, he speaks so uh, he understands uh, German quite well, but he's going to give his answers in English. Thank you for this invitation. It's really a very special thing for me to be in Berlin. I'm very happy to be here to discuss uh, prosperity without growth. Vielen Dank. Um, what 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 what's on earth? could have motivated me to rewrite um, what I had already done. I started out, I think, with the idea that um, it was six, seven years after the crisis. It was six or seven years, eight or nine years after I had started writing. And that we, we had a different understanding of where we were in the economy, um, but that I could basically do the same thing I'd done before, but update the graphs just change a few figures here and there and put some new numbers in. After all, I'd been speaking about it for seven or eight years, so what could I possibly know now that I didn't know then? I'd been rehearsing the arguments over and again. But a strange thing happened when I sat down to write, which was that I realized how much things had moved on and how much actually when I had been talking about it in rooms full of people like this and the conversations that I had had, how much that had actually crystallized uh, the arguments that I had put a little cloudily before. It was a book, actually, it was never intended for a wide audience. It was a book that was intended as a report to my government, to the government in the UK. And I had never written it, actually, for a wide audience. And I began to realize, as I sat down to write the update, that I, I actually owed it 
both to myself in terms of the way the arguments had moved on and to that wider audience to write it in a slightly different way. So the things that I tried to do, yes, I did update the graphs. You'll be pleased to know. And I put a few new ones in, and I made sure all the figures were right and the numbers were right. But I, I wanted, in particular, really, to get beyond the title of the book. Many people, actually, it's, and it's a problem with a, with a book that becomes well-known, many people never get beyond the title. And they say, oh, that guy, Tim Jackson, who talks about not having growth. Yeah, we know all about him. But actually, the book didn't just do that. It tried to do a couple of things more than that. One was to situate that debate as a real dilemma, a dilemma that faces politicians, that faces enterprise, that faces us as people. And people, some people, the people who read the first edition did get that. But what they didn't get, and it's always surprised me, they didn't always get that I was proposing very specific things about the economy. And, and by the time I got to writing the second edition, I guess I was much clearer about what those things were. And, and very specifically, Das Update is really an update of those routes, those avenues out of crisis, out of the dilemma. And I wanted to set down very clearly what I saw as the foundations for a different kind of economy, the economy of tomorrow. Eine der Kritiken des One of uh, the criticisms of the first book was that it was focused too much on the people in the north. What is new now in the book? A criticism of the first book, because from the very beginning, I was absolutely clear about the relationship between the material conditions, the, the economic conditions, if you like, in the poorest economies in the world, and, and prosperity. In those poor countries, prosperity depends on improving material conditions. It improves on having, it, it depends on having better health, it depends on having better education, it depends on having better houses, it, it depends on having, um, um, energy and safe water and all of these things actually depend a little bit on an economy that provides material conditions. And I was always very, very clear that, that it wasn't an argument against an economic growth in the poorest countries in the world. And it, it, even the first edition actually had a lot of evidence within it that as incomes improve from very, very poor to around about ten or thousand, ten or fifteen thousand dollars per capita. As you as you go up that that curve of income growth, you get the biggest gains in terms of prosperity. You get better participation in education. You get better life expectancy. You get vastly reduced infant mortality. So kids live longer in poorer countries if we can make room for growth and better material conditions in those countries. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind about that. And that didn't change between the first edition and the second edition. It became much stronger in my mind that the argument was really an argument about uh, the conditions of the advanced economies and the responsibilities of the advanced economies to make room for growth where growth really matters. I think all the not only the title. Well, I think that everyone who uh, has written more than the title of the book will have encountered time and again the word prosperity. And I think it might be a good idea if once again you define for us what prosperity means to you. And then could you please also say something about uh, prosperity and the different interpretations, connotations, and definitions of uh, prosperity depending on the sociocultural context? For that piece of work, it, it, what is prosperity? Was ist denn Wohlstand? Was heißt das? And, and it was my earliest inquiry when I sat down to write that book was to try to understand how how we not just me individually but how people understand prosperity how they define prosperity how they think about it and i was actually drawn to a literature that goes back to the 1970s which is about poverty 
the opposite, if you like, of prosperity. And, and in particular to a set of ideas that began to understand that poverty is only partly about the material conditions of life. It's also critically about the social conditions of life. It's about the psychological conditions of life. It's about our ability to participate in society. It's about our sense of meaning and purpose. It's about our ability to engage with others in our community. It's about our identities and our aspirations. In other words, it's a, it's a very broad set of ideals for a kind of social progress, to do well in the world, to be well, to flourish. And to do that, and I think this was the, the difference between those older set of ideas and the ideas that I wanted to bring forward, to be able to flourish, to have the capability to flourish within the limits of a finite planet. How, how do we go about doing that? It can't be by having more and more stuff but we don't want to rule out the possibility of doing well. We want something that is a little bit like having a better life while consuming less, having more fun with less stuff, having Wohlstand ohne Wachstum. Some people, when talking about prosperity, say it should be a good life for all, and this is what Andreas is going to focus on later in the uh, Debate. Some movements, for example, um, in the UK, um, Action for Happiness, um, and the, the foundation for that is what does it mean for us as human beings to be happy and how do we get to that point? That debate about the good life and what it means to have a good life is one of the oldest debates under the sun and it's become one of the most important debates in our particular time because we are right at the point where we cannot afford to get that wrong anymore. We can't afford to have a version of the good life that says, hey guys, you can all be a billionaire like me and one day you too can be in the White House. This just doesn't work as a vision for approaching 10 billion people on the planet. And mm -hmm. so we need something that works better mm -hmm. than that, that's a realistic vision for mm -hmm. a better life. Yeah, I think that it's an old... Well, I also think it's an ancient topic, a topic humanity has always uh, thought and talked about to ensure a good life for all, independent of uh, the state and the society they live in. Uh, life without poverty, without uh, war, is something that everybody strives for. When in the history of politics and economics was there a moment where people decided that uh, prosperity equals growth. What happened there? I mean, just to, to speak first of the point about the social and cultural context, I think it's, it is interesting that the idea that Wohlstand is, that prosperity is delivered purely through material conditions and increasing economic output is a, is a primarily Western idea. And although, of course, poorer countries want to grow, one of the biggest surprises to me was coming across a country like Ecuador, for example, who in 2008, around about the same time I was writing this book, was writing the concept of buen vivir, living well, into their constitution. And I was at a meeting at the UN where the moderator turned to the people from Ecuador and said, this is just a rich country's agenda, isn't it? You're not interested in prosperity without growth, are you? And the, and the respondent from Ecuador, um, a minister from Ecuador, said, actually, you know, if growth means turning everything into Western values, turning us all into consumers, undermining the health of the planet, then thank you very much, we'll do without it. We want something that looks like buen vivir, something that looks like living well. And so that, that again was a sort of surprise to me that this cultural idea of living well is, is not itself Western. What's Western is the idea that you deliver that entirely not just materially, but socially and psychologically through consumer goods, through material things. That's the Western vision. Now, where did it come from? Did it have any roots in reality? Yes, of course it did. A hundred years ago, 200 years ago, we were, by our own standards, unimaginably poor. 
Our grandparents, great-grandparents could not possibly have imagined the wealth that we have, the material conditions that we have at the moment. And it did deliver good things. It delivered increased life expectancy. It delivered better sanitation. Growth delivered us choice. It delivered us, to some extent, even democracy. It, uh, it delivered us the ability to, to create political consensus around an idea of social progress. Growth did give us these good things. And to that extent, it was the foundation of where we are today. But the, the, the critical point is to ask, is that still a robust model? Does it still work? Or did we just get hooked on the idea, this particular idea of material progress, so badly that we can no longer get off it, even though we would like to? And, and, and that's the challenge, I think. That's where we are. It's not about demonizing the progress that growth brought us in the past. It is about asking the question, what is next for social progress? Ein ganz wichtiger Ausgangspunkt a very important starting point in your book is that you say we are in the midst of a growth dilemma. And this has a lot to do with what you just mentioned. The acceptance of the model is there, actually. So what is the growth dilemma? This would be my first question. And then, of course, how can we get out of this dilemma? It's easier than the second question. Um, the first question is very simple. What is the dilemma? As I phrase it, um, that growth at least in the way that we've had it, has reached a point where it is now unsustainable, untenable to think that we could grow our material impacts on the planet. So that's point one of a dilemma. A dilemma has usually two horns. Growth is unsustainable. But I was very early on in our inquiry, I was confronted, because I was working for a government commission, I was confronted with what was actually the visceral fear of politicians whenever you even set out to question growth. Because when growth goes away in the kind of economies that we have, people lose their jobs, firms go out of businesses, and governments that don't respond appropriately very soon find themselves out of office. The place without growth in a growth-based society is a deeply uncomfortable one. It's a structurally unstable one. It's a place where actually really bad things can happen. And we saw that in, in, for example, partly in the collapse of the Soviet Union. In the collapse during that period of collapse of the, social, of the Soviet Union, life expectancy amongst men dropped by almost a decade. In Greece, exactly more recently, we saw the same thing. When you set within a growth-based society the dial into the degrowth direction, um, then things start to go bad. So there's the dilemma. Growth is unsustainable. Degrowth is unstable, at least in the form that we have seen it. And that is the fundamental basis of that dilemma. And it seems to me, you, to, get, to come to your second question, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, the whole book is about. Um, so please do take a little bit of time to look at what I'm saying there rather than just what I have time to say here. Uh, you basically, I mean, if you, you could approach this as a, in a logical way, if you've got a dilemma which says growth is unsustainable, degrowth is unstable, you've got basically two, three choices. One is to throw up your hands in despair and run away and hide somewhere because things are going to get bad and you want to be in the best place possible to hide from that. That's choice one. It's not a particularly safe choice, I would say. Um, the second choice is to make growth sustainable, to d deny that horn of the dilemma and say, actually, no, we can have green growth, we can have smart growth, we can have uh, clean growth, we can have sustainable growth, we're going to make growth sustainable somehow. So that's option one. And option two is to say this degrowth position, this decroissance, this uh, different kind of economy, this post-growth economy actually might make some sense. We could actually think about the economy in a different way. We could build the foundations differently. And that was very much the focus for the strategy that I outline in Das Update, was to say, actually, there's a different kind of economy there. And if we think about the fundamentals of that economy in a systematic way, actually, we can break that dilemma. Yeah, I will speak. Well, later on in the discussion with Andreas Novi, I would 
like uh, to take a closer look at the instability that you mentioned, because I think in particular the social dimension when we degrow or if when we grow less is the main aspect that we have to deal with from a concept conceptual point of view, from an intellectual point of view as society, because unstable societies um, also have to uh, or we also have to think about the political situation in an unstable um, society. Unstable societies have the tendency to move towards the right uh, more strongly, and um, we will talk about that later on in the debate. Yes, a very important question. Well, now we would like to uh, briefly go through your book, and you just mentioned that one answer might be that growth can be green, can be turned green, and one answer also is efficiency and decoupling of economic growth uh, and the consumption of resources. So decoupling is the important term here. So can you describe it? Can we manage to stay within the limits of our planet to stay below the two degree uh, objective simply by decoupling? It's the question that I had to answer before I could get on to the second bit of the dilemma. Can we make growth sustainable through technology? And if not, why not? Now, it's a kind of a, my answer to that question is, is a slightly, um, it's not entirely straightforward because there is no yes or no answer to whether technology um, can achieve the gains that we want to achieve. Are there low carbon technologies that could supply the energy that we need to make growth go on and on and on forever um, in the way that we would like it to do? And and it's it's really interesting to think that actually there are such technologies, the renewable energy technologies, solar technologies, resource productivity, different ways of organizing transport systems, a whole plethora of technological possibilities. And sometimes when I'm teaching my kids in, in the university, what I see when I show, I sh I, that's not allowed to call them kids, right? No. Okay. So <laughs> they're, they're not, they're not listening. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm at an age when I can think of almost everybody as a kid. Sorry about that, guys. But um, <laughs> um, the, the point, I suppose, is that when you show certainly a younger generation of students um, that challenge, they see it as just that, as a challenge. Yes, of course, I can make that happen. I can get from 600 um, grams of carbon per dollar of economic output to less than zero in 30 years. Just give me the opportunity to do it. It's a technological challenge um, that they relish, actually, that is relished by a generation of technological optimists, I think we, we could call them. Um, and I am not the person to say you can't do that, because I know that technology changes very rapidly. I know that actually those technologies, to some extent, do exist, but my question is different. My question is, could we achieve that technological transition in this kind of society, in this kind of economy? And that's the point where you begin to ask the more subtle questions, the more nuanced questions about how this economy works, how it built consumerism, how it chased endless hedonism as a way of keeping the economy stable. And you realize, actually, that it is a system built around that incentive, not just to keep growing and to grow sustainably, but to be more and more materialistic, to be more and more hedonistic. And hence, my answer to that question, it's not a technological answer. It's not even an economic answer at one point. It's actually a social answer. We do not have the kind of society in which we could remotely achieve that technological potential. And so the answer is no, we can't actually make growth in this system sustainable. And that's what pushes me then to address the second um, horn of the dilemma, which is all about envisaging a different kind of economy, an economy that works, an economy that works for everyone rather than for the few, 
and an economy that stays within the limits of a finite planet. Yeah, fine. Um, well, I think we have almost um, gone through all the questions. I think we have a huge task ahead of us when we want to achieve uh, prosperity without growth. And there are many people who are already uh, showing a different lifestyle. There are very many ideas around the idea of post-growth. Uh, your book is a contribution in this regard. And now I would like, together with you, Andreas Novi, I would like to ask you to come to the podium uh, to talk about questions uh, as regards how can we achieve a, a post-growth society or um, prosperity without growth. So Andreas, please come to the podium. Thank you, Tim. You are in the midst. I'm sitting. I'm sitting right side from you. Yeah. Well, welcome. Um, and thank you for your attention uh, so far. Um, I would like to introduce you Andreas Novi. Andreas Novi is a professor at the Economics University in Vienna and is the head of the Institute for Multi-Level Governance and Development. And um, you, so you might explain to us what multi-level governance actually is in the course of our discussion now. At the same time, Andreas Novi is also a spokesperson of the Green uh, Bildungswerk, Green Educational uh, Institute, which is not as big and well-funded as the Heinrich Böll Foundation, but the Green um, Educational Institute in Austria is similar. Uh, and you are a member of the board. And um, in addition, Andreas is also the initiator and co-organizer -organ of a large congress in Austria uh, under the headline, Good Living for Everyone, or A Good Life for Everyone. This congress took place in 2015 for the first time. And it is a great event which takes place at the University of Vienna. It is organized by an alliance of growth critics, trade unions. This is something that we um, sometimes miss a little bit here in Germany. Also environmental organizations, um, development organizations who, similar as we in Germany, are dealing with the question, is there a prosperity without growth and a good life for everyone? So welcome, Andreas. I'm happy to have you here. Thank you. Well, Andreas, has um, dealt with the book as an economics professor and as someone who has been uh, working in the field of development and would like to give you the opportunity for 10 minutes to talk about your criticism or also uh, about the things that you liked about the book. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to comment the book. The book is uh, part of a lecture at our economics university that all students, which are 20,000, have to read or should read. This means that I'm, I'm quite happy that there is an update now. And uh, I eagerly read the book. I'm trying to, uh, uh, to, to sketch out four aspects that are very important to me. 
I think your book is a very important contribution to the overall debate when it comes to social and ecological transformation. And this is actually the main uh, focus of the Heinrich Böll Foundation as well. And then it's about basic changes, fundamental changes. And I usually get the impression that usually people don't understand the seriousness about the fundamental changes. And the good thing about the book is that it deals with basic forms of our uh, economic proceedings, and the forms that need to change, like growth and consumption. It is also a book, and this is one of the main changes compared with the first uh, edition, with the first book, that deals with a good life uh, for everyone. And those of you who have not yet read the book, it's, it's much more about uh, imbalances, about injustices. It's about poverty, uh, as has already been mentioned, but poverty in a sense as it is defined by Adam Smith to be able to appear in public without shame. This means not to be poor. So poverty as some kind of relation. And this is nicely described, also the relation uh, in the global uh, system. And this leads me to the questions that um, are important to us in our alliance uh, as well. So how can we organize the economy in a way that everyone can lead a good life? And this also means, and it has already mentioned here, this means that we have to provide a good life for everyone and not only for a few. And um, the question of the generalization is very important. So we do not only want to provide a good life for an elite in Western countries. However, the book also deals with the question and with this question, and this is why it is very important. Ma. The book also talks about consumerism as a topic, and consumerism in economic studies is hardly ever discussed and investigated because it's uh, also part and parcel of the quality of life to consume. And here the book talks about uh, the problem that we have when needs are just satisfied on the basis of consumption. And the book talks about social and ecological infrastructure, not always showing all the necessary uh, aspects around it. But there is a proposal that we need another infrastructure, uh, a city of uh, where everything is in proximity where everything can be reached via bicycle and so on and so forth. And uh, the, the question is, uh, uh, why does the concept between, uh, that we have when we talk about material values, the uh, utility uh, and uh, uh, also the value of uh, material assets uh, as an object which can be changed, exchanged, or sold? Then thirdly, growth. There is a major insight that growth was part of the success story of the last 200 years, as we have said. But the major problem uh, is that growth is no longer a success story, but rather has become a problem in the 21st century. In the book, Good Life, for, when, when the book talks about good life uh, for all, uh, then, of course, we have to differentiate between the South and the North when we talk about growth and whether growth can be continued. It's also a topic that is controversially discussed within trade union circles. Uh, well, the, well, I've talked about consumption and the value or the useful value, the utility of uh, items. Now we have more topics in the book, namely competition. And uh, competition triggers uh, the need to always improve, because if you don't improve any more, you might vanish. And in that uh, book, we have 
we have statements saying, well, uh, we reduce everything to the uh, question of who owns the means of productions. And uh, even in capital, uh, capitalist countries, we still have uh, state ownership of uh, certain productive assets. So based on the definition of capitalism and competition, which is seen as a driving force within capitalism, there I think the book also uh, shows us that we cannot have a post-growth capitalism. I don't think we have can have a capitalism of that kind. We can have a post-growth society, but not a capitalism. Or we can have a market economy, a post-capitalist, uh, post-growth market economy. But capitalism as such does, wouldn't work. And there's one more question, namely, what does it mean to live in uh, the society we currently if, live in? And that has something to do with our political actions. In the book, you find lots of proposals that I would absolutely agree with as far as reforms are concerned, as far as a more realistic understanding is concerned. In the first book, uh, the Green New Deal was something you were fascinated with. In the second book, uh, you uh, saying that this alone would not be enough, and there are not enough powerful actors to, uh, to develop this Green New Deal further. But there's one thing that I miss in the book. That's a question of power. In a way, it seems we might develop a good economy, and uh, we will explain that to political decision makers, and we hope they will understand and really implement it. And there I see two problems. And these will be my last statements, because I have to stick to the 10 minutes allocated for my intervention. The question of power always has two aspects. One aspect is why is nothing happening? Nothing happens because in recent years, economic and political power have become more and more integrated, have more and more merged. And so people believe, well, the things that the market can't do will be done by politicians, by political decision makers. And I mean, they are uh, turning doors in the central banks and in the energy agencies. Uh, the uh, private enterprises go and see the uh, regulator and vice versa. And I think we have to understand this essential element of our economy and uh, political reality, and that will make changes much more difficult. There's a second aspect, an aspect very important for the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Uh, political action in uh, uh, this social uh, transformation must take place beyond the governmental official structures. Uh, the book talks about encouragement for grassroots movement, but there is a second aspect. And that would be an aspect that would definitely have been mentioned by our colleague from New Delhi. Carrying out political work on the grassroots level, triggering changes, and uh, this aspect of empowerment for the grassroots level, empowerment to take our own destiny in our hands, that is something very important if we really want to change the system. Thank you, Andreas. Now, we've got four very good topics to talk about, and uh, there's no need to ask uh, a lot of questions on my side. I'll first of all, just hand over to Tim, and uh, he can now respond to uh, Andres' statements about the book and how he sees it. I didn't quite understand the first question, so I don't have to answer that. I'd like, I suppose, let me pick up, first of all, um, the, the question of um, capitalism, 
because it is, you know, it's one of those, it's one of those issues around the book that has, for me, been the most challenging in the history of the book. And I, I should say, I should say from the first that I approached the work that we were doing in the commission very much from a critical perspective on capitalism. We were, though, a government commission um, writing a report in a capitalist economy that was very much growth-based, and we had already confronted one huge shibboleth, one huge taboo in questioning um, growth itself. And somewhere, and I'm not saying that I ever consciously thought this or, or I or I specifically framed it anywhere, somewhere there must have been in the back of my mind the idea that um, if I made it also about capitalism as well as about growth, um, then we would be shut down before the report ever saw the light of day, which may, I mean, we were shut down shortly afterwards anyway, so it may have been, a, <laughs> it might have been a kind of false, a false, uh, you know, a bargain with the devil, so to speak. But actually when I came to writing about capitalism, and writing about growth, I decided that they were actually different issues. That, that you can have a non-capitalist economy that is very growth-based, you can have some capitalist economies that barely are growth-based at all, you can have capitalist economies that are much more around a social market idea of what society is, and then you have this Anglo-centric model of hyper-financialized over-consumerism, um, that that uh, that is the, the the archetype, if you like, of what we would like to think of as good capitalism, because it grows as fast as it possibly can. So, because I hadn't spoken definitively about capitalism, I, at the end of the first book, I basically said, you know, is it capitalism? Isn't it capitalism? Um, it, to paraphrase Dr. Spock, it's you know capitalism, Jim, but not as we know it, and that and that was a it was a little bit of a it was a little bit of a get out I think um, in a way and as and it became very clear because as soon as I went into the debate I was shot at from both sides I was shot at from those who as soon as I questioned growth immediately said that I was a communist and then I was shot at from particularly from the degrowth, degrowth movement who said you have not criticized capitalism you're part of the establishment and and so it was very clear to me that I was in exactly the right place because I was being shot at from both directions. Um, but the question of capitalism didn't go away. It became a part of my, you know, my onward thinking. And in particular, it became part of my onward research work. So one of the reasons, for example, um, uh, that, that capitalism and growth often go together is that it has been... It has been agreed, actually, by a, by a group of, mainly by a group of ecological economists, that if you have, if you charge interest on capital, which is the pretty much the f most fundamental thing to define capitalism by, the charging of interest on capital, um, then you have a growth imperative. You immediately have a growth imperative. You can't get off it. You have to have a growth-based system, and therefore growth and capitalism don't go together. Now, I was fascinated by that question, so we set out to prove it. And I set out with, with Peter Victor, a couple of other colleagues, to do some economic modeling to figure out whether economics is actually telling us that that is true, that if you charge interest on capital, then you have to have growth. And it turned out that it was wrong. It turned out that that does not hold, that you can formulate an economy in which you're charging interest on capital, and it does not have that growth imperative written into it in that way. So I had failed, in a way, to answer the question that I was chasing down. Do we have to throw away growth and capitalism, or is there a form of capital, of charging interest on capital, of ownership of assets, that could be consistent with a, a steady state economy? And each one of those questions, actually, as I've chased them down in the economic literature, I still, frustratingly, don't entirely have an answer to. And I come back, more or less, I think, to where I was before, that a steady state economy, a degrowth economy, a post-growth economy, a more socially just economy, an economy that works for everyone and not the few, is a very, very different beast. 
And I'm going to just leave it to someone else to define whether it's capitalism or not, because it's kind of a very, very frustrating question. As soon as you open the question, it becomes so divided. What's very clear to me is that neither capitalism nor the only alternative that we saw to it in the past hundred years is anywhere near solving either the debate between capitalism and communism or the question of growth itself. And so we have to somehow, I think, suspend that question. That's what I would like to do. And I know that's quite a big ask in a very fractured place. Let me come, I know we want to get to the audience, but let me come to the power question because there I think I'm more with you on that question. The book, the book speaks of power. It speaks of powerlessness. It speaks of poverty. It speaks of those left behind. It speaks of financialization and the way that that rewarded a minority. So it speaks to that question of power um, in, the, in the subtext, in the, in the content of it, in the way that I address the arguments. But I, I would absolutely agree that power needs to be talked about more. In, in one of the chapters of the book, and it's one which I developed quite a lot during the rewrite around the idea of the progressive state, I tried very specifically to confront what you were suggesting, essentially, that, that um, this view of government as being essentially powerless because it's captured by the interests of those on whom it depends for its legitimacy and for its revenues. And, and I think that, that that characterization of government is a fair characterization of government in the trap that it now sits in. And, and where does that trap come from? It comes from the idea that social stability depends on economic stability and that economic stability depends on economic growth. And in those circumstances, surely the first job of government is to protect social stability, so they have to chase economic growth. And so they have to chase all those industries they believe will give them economic growth, and they have to chase, chase the revenues that will come from those industries to give them power to govern. And that's, and that's a kind of a, a trap. That's a trap that government is in because we live in a system in which we believe, rightly or wrongly, that social stability depends on economic growth. If we can divorce those things, if we can create an economically stable system that doesn't depend on growth, if we can create an economically stable system in which a socially sta stable system which does not depend on growth, then it puts government in a totally different position. It gives government legitimacy to be a government for everyone, to govern for the many and not for the few. It actually uh, takes away from them this burden of forever keeping industry in its pocket in order to line the coffers of the election funds so that it can stay in power. Because this legitimacy does not come from the vision of increasing, endlessly increasing growth and paying homage to all the countries, the companies that you think will deliver it to you. It comes from a different place. It comes from the legitimacy of the sovereign state to look after the welfare of its people. And that's the vision that I put at the heart of this chapter about the progressive state, which I think speaks a little bit, at least, to your, your question about power. Ja, sehr, bitte klatschen Sie. Um, es ist immer erlaubt. You're always welcome to give Tim a hand. Andreas Novi said in that book, there are many proposals for reforms, for next steps to be taken. And I think all of us who want to have prosperity without uh, growth, uh, uh, we really would like to hear about those proposals, how to really make it happen. And of course, uh, we all know we need reforms. We need to create a framework to be able to think about the future. And one of the major issues, as Tim has just said, is the question, where do we have both theoretical and practical political answers? Do we have theoretical concepts? Do we have practical answers to the question, how 
in a complex society with all the social issues and their link to growth, how to get out of this vicious circle. Is disruption the only way to go forward? I don't want to see social disruption in our society where we start being innovative only when feel when people are really, really poor. And if we have completely deindustrialized, we don't want this to happen. So what are the ways to go forward? How can we deal with these issues? How can we make progress? Do we have any concepts for that? Would you like to start, Andreas? What's your view? I'll give, I'll give it a try. I think one of uh, the approaches worth considering is to uh, take this criticism of consumerism seriously and to develop a political project that is focused on the fulfillment of people's needs with less consumption. That would mean we have to build up infrastructure. And there the city is a very important uh, place. There we need, of course, to have uh, democratic interaction because there is, of course, infrastructure in place, but it's focused again on growth. And we need a totally different type of infrastructure to ensure a good life for all. And there, again, we are encountering questions of power. In order to develop such an infrastructure, people must feel empowered to be politicians, to take political decisions, to shape the political landscapes. Uh, you said something nice yesterday. You gave the Vienna example where in the early 30s you had very ex good social infrastructure which promoted equality. And uh, uh, there there was a strong fo focus on social well-being and less consumption. In the interim war period, there was uh, the so-called Red Vienna model. The interesting thing in this local socialism between the wars was that it was a kind of uh, situation that did not focus on increase of wages. And Red Vienna developed a very ambitious program in order to increase people's quality of life. They have created housing. They've created leisure time facilities. The health and education system was open. The quality of these services were was improved. And coexistence, living together, was organized in a, in, a, in a different way. People focused on quality of life. And there were always this discussions about social infrastructure. And uh, it, this model is has been researched in uh, the social uh, sciences. And it's also a very ecological, social and ecological model that was developed there. Uh, and that was something that's also in, in discussed in the UK as foundation uh, and economy. So such things must be developed further. We need leisure time facilities. We need to have opportunities for, for people to have recreation in their immediate environment in order to consume less, in order to also consume less resources. That would be prosperity without growth. The question also goes to you, what are ways uh, to answer the question, not only through disruptions? Examples, and, and the, it's not the only one by any means. The Mondragon cooperatives, the transition town movement, the places where different social experiments are being undertaken to live in a different way, to accept actually that we live on a, a planet with finite limits and to over consume in one place is to, is, to, is to consign other people and other species to poverty and to destruction and to find the ways of living better with less. And so I, I, I love those examples. I think, I think since the book was first published, I, one of the most 
heartwarming parts of it actually has been the number of people who've come to me and said, look, this is exactly what's informing the way that we develop this social enterprise, that social experiment, this ethical fund, uh, this library of things, this, this repair center, uh, you know, a, a whole stream of people, a real richness coming from the ground up to show that, that change is possible. And, and to me, that, that has, a, it has a sort of authenticity to it. It has a, a sense of hope to it. It isn't ever going to be entirely enough because I think we live in the grip of a social illusion that has been propagated by a set of institutions that are no longer functional. And let me try and get to what I think the core of that illusion is. If you think about the consumer society and you think about what the promises are, the allure of the consumer society. It's essentially that the next newest thing in our life will make our life so much better. And, and that's sometimes true. Actually, sometimes those new things do momentarily make our lives better. And then we realize that actually that was yesterday's thing. That was something that I'm going to be bored with tomorrow. That's not actually what I needed in order to satisfy the fact that I'm craving love and affection rather than material flashy goods. That's not something that brings me strength of community. And what comes back from that is dissatisfaction. Now, what's most strange about it is that it's that dissatisfaction that the system absolutely needs in order to be successful. It needs us not just to like new things. It needs us to be dissatisfied with all of those new things as soon as we've got them, because that's the only thing that will persuade us to get out and consume again. It's a system in which the social model is built around dissatisfaction. And I think what these social experiments and in a sense what the conceptual framework of the book is to is to call that into the light of day and say that a system built around dissatisfaction is deeply dysfunctional what if we were to build that system actually around fulfillment about the enrichment of relationships about the strengthening of communities around our ability actually to to, to, to envisage ourselves as human beings connected to each other with a sense of identity and purpose? What if we were to build it around participating in society and to create the institutions that support that framework? That is a positive social vision for change that has enormous appeal, and I think, and I think it speaks very much to the idea of, of the good life. It speaks to people actually in very deprived communities. We have a research project which is looking in some of the poorest and most deprived parts of the UK, asking what is the good life here for you under these conditions, and how on earth can you achieve it? And those are the conversations, the social conversations, that are absolutely critical to this new vision. It can't entirely happen without institutional changes without changes to policy but it is the core of a very yeah. different way of thinking about social change um, ich glaube, wir teilen alle. i think we all uh, share this vision and also the social or ecological infrastructure in order to create better conditions for a different a better life with less consumption. I think we all agree to that, but I'm not fully satisfied with the answer because I was also asking, or I also have to raise the question, how can industrial work at Daimler or at uh, VW or in the chemical industry, which are well paid employees in this country. I mean, I can't tell them, well, now you should only use the social infrastructure. And I can't tell them, well, uh, you should open up a repair cafe. This cannot be the, the, the only answer to the problem. And I know that I'm opening up a huge discussion here, a huge d debate. Uh, however, I do, I do not expect um, a complete answer from you. But I would like to talk about the question. I think that we have to understand what kind of huge transformation task lies ahead of us. We have to get down from an enormous level 
and I'm one of those people who are still searching for answers. I do not have any answers yet. Um, and I hope that the book will uh, give one or the other person the right idea um, concerning the kind of alliances that we have to forge or the gaps that we have to fill. I mean, you have an institute that is dealing with the open questions. So what do we need to be able to better answer the questions? That's a really good, a really good question. One's parents are often, you know, the most the people we want to impress the most and also the hardest to impress. And when the first edition of Prosperity Without Growth came out, my father was one of those workers in that kind of industry. He said, my whole life I have been about making things. And that making things actually is not just the means to a livelihood, it's a kind of a joy. It is a contribution to society. Are you telling me that my entire life actually has been the wrong life? And, and so, you know, it was the typical father-son conversation without any tension whatsoever. Um, and, and it's, but it's an absolutely critical question. The, the one thing I can say in answer to it is that I have been in talk, speaking with those kinds of industries in those kinds of places with people who understand actually that there is a concept of, uh, of change, of transformation, that they must rethink a business model and it's not to say that we will have no no need for the chemical industry or for the manufacturing industry of course we will we will have an absolute need for those industries to be working efficiently in low carbon ways investing in the goods and services that improve the quality of our lives those people as workers as contributors of society to society still matter but the future of the economy can no longer be the mass production of more and more stuff and the impacts that that has on the planet. We have to think beyond that, and that does mean transforming industry. It does mean transforming business. It means thinking beyond material production and into the idea that actually enterprise is about service, it's about care, it's about health, it's about education, it's about craft. Yes, make things, still make things, but make them really well and make them to last. And it's about the creativity and the culture that binds us together and makes our society. And the most extraordinary thing to me about that is that that economy is an economy with plenty of work in it. That work is never going to go away. I remember visiting the southern European states just after the, the crisis when there were 50 to 60 percent youth unemployment after the financial crisis. And looking around the economies and thinking, why is there 50 and 60 percent unemployment here? Is there no work to do? Are there no sick people to be looked after? Is there no elderly people who need some care? Are there no kids who could do with smaller classroom sizes? Are there no buildings to be refurbished? Is there no green spaces to be protected? Is there no communities to be built? Is there no creativity that would improve the quality of our lives and allow us to express ourselves in a better way? And of course, if you ask the question in that way, the demand for work and for people's participation in work is enormous. That, w that demand will never go away as long as we can get that economic system right and we can deliver the ability for people to work in that way, to participate meaningfully in creating a good society. Um. In the lecture that uh, I have uh, talked about earlier, where we also talk about your book, the core thesis that is the starting point of this lecture is uh, we cannot continue uh, with business as usual. And this, I would say, is the decisive aspect that we as uh, scientists can also work on and where we can make a contribution. Um, I think it would be arrogant to say we know how the new society or the new economy will look like, but to talk about that, to insist on that is already revolutionary because the overall need of political decision makers and also the, uh, the belonging of 
people uh, to continue um, with business as usual is that to insist on the thesis we cannot continue uh, like that means that we embark on a very important transformation process which might lead to difficult situations or even conflicts because there will also be losers. There will be groups in society that will have less than before the transformation. And this is why this discussion and this debate is a political debate. And on the other hand, it's also a debate where we have to try to find a new order that is a better order, a better system for many people. So uh, I can't give you a direct answer except for certain bits and pieces. I think that it is to a certain degree about the um, reduction of uh, international or, or global economic connections as regards Germany, I would say, and Germany would like to export its uh, success model uh, throughout Europe. Um, I think we cannot uh, generalize the idea that um, exporting more than importing is a good model. It can only be thought in connection with a competition uh, or competing uh, system. And so this is one approach in your book. And of course, we do need massive regulation and also restrictions of the global financial markets. And of course, we do need limits to the power of large corporations. And of course, this is something that we already know. But um, the question, therefore, is rather how can we forge alliances? How can we get political power in order to also realize what is actually or what seems logical? Thank you very much, Andreas. I, uh, someone is waving the hand. I cannot identify the person. I would like to make the following suggestion. You will have the opportunity now to raise questions. And I would also like to include everyone outside this room. Please come and s I mean, we cannot allow everyone uh, into the room uh, because of fire protection rules. But uh, everyone who has a question will have the opportunity to raise it. You can come inside one by one. And I think that many people like to um, have a good debate. And um, the shorter your statements, the more people will be able to raise a question. I think this is also a, a nice um, rule. There are microphones around in the room, so please help me. It will be very difficult now, very uh, very demanding now. So we might uh, start there, the gentleman in the back, and then we will go over to the center here. Exactly my question, how do we get the power? It seems to me the current powers that are capitalism, governments, whatever, they're entwined with big corporations, have a very, very strong incentive to keep the system the way it is, to keep people afraid of their jobs and without social welfare and uh, exactly what you said, uh, Mr. Jackson, about um, uh, being unfulfilled and unhappy in your life to crave, consume. How do we get this, this incentive uh, for them to, to change their, their ways? Is the, like how do we get the power to change them against their will, or how do they, uh, yeah, change society? That's like the big question. Yeah. Well, revolution usually leads with fundamentalists on top, so not a great alternative either. Please raise your hand so you can get the microphone. I collect it. Okay, so basically my question is the same. Isn't this like a call for revolution? Isn't that the, the only way to go on the streets to, I don't know, break stuff? Uh, I mean, do you really believe that all those little transitions that doing doing in little communities or whatever are gonna gonna change the whole way? <laughs> because the whole book looks like a turn in the complete opposite direction. And how how is that gonna be possible? Uh. 
I know I'm asking this question to two economists, so perhaps it's the wrong question, but I didn't hear you mention the word culture in German or English even once. And um, actually, my question is exactly the opposite of that one. I mean, aren't you ultimately talking about a cultural revolution that happens to happen first before a social and political one? Um, I mean, ultimately, this is how you know, West Germany changed. The student movement started out with explicitly political demands. It became a cultural revolution, moved into the new social movements, and changed Germany you know, politically um, you know, immensely through this way. Aren't we ultimately talking about changes you know, in values that are going to kind of happen at a cultural level first before they happen anywhere else? Einfach damit alle verstehen to let everyone understand how we will proceed. Three questions, three answers. Everyone will have a chance, promise. I mean, those who have raised their hand, of course. Tim. Uh, OK, so, so is the book a call to a revolution? Um, actually, I, I, I'm not sure that's my question to answer. Um, it, it, you know, it, th th that's a very, very critical social discussion and, and a point at which particularly a younger generation must make up its own mind. My own, my own sense of that and my sense of looking at where revolutions have happened and what they've achieved is that I would avoid that at all costs. I mean, if you look at, not at all costs, not at all costs, because there are places where that call for revolution clearly, clearly is about the overthrow of absolutely despotic situations in which people are, are uh -huh. suffering very badly. But our situation is not that. And, and this, this, there are people who are suffering, and there, are pe there is a lot of dissatisfaction and there is already some political movement that expresses that dissatisfaction. Actually, in the UK, paradoxically, you know, quite a strong movement that had a, a completely unexpected effect on the last election just a, a few weeks ago. But my concern about the, the call for revolution is that it is that, that you look around at what happens after revolutions and there's, there's vacuums of power, there's vacuums of structure, there's destruction of infrastructure, there's loss of life, there's loss of vitality, there's a decline in life expectancy in many of the places where we look at that. And, so, and, and it seems to me that in the circumstances that we're now facing, that concept of revolution actually is, a potentially, is potentially a dangerous one. But that is not to say I think that we accept tinkering at the edges with policy changes at the margin. In fact, that's, and, and I'm really glad that you picked up that the book is not saying that. It is talking about radical transformation. And for me, transformation sits in the middle of that idea of revolution with all its potentially unpleasant consequences and reform with all its sense of the status quo. Transformation is about turning things upside down conceptually, being in intellectually honest about the challenges we face, searching for the solutions in the social sphere, in experiments, social experiments, in the political sphere as well, doing what Bernie Sanders and Momentum and Corbyn did with those dissatisfactions and expressing them in political ways, doing what's necessary, actually, to confront the power imbalances that the first person was alerting us to. That, that question of power balances is, is going to be increasingly important. Um, it's absolutely clear that there are going to be losers. I would say that there are, to be honest, I would say there already are losers. There are losers to the kinds of transformations that we have seen in the past. They're the losers of the industries in material production and in fossil fuel extraction. There are communities in, in this country and in my country which have been decimated, actually, by the closing down of coal mines and the transfer of power away from that once very powerful industry. And we have not looked after those interests. We have let communities suffer endlessly because of a shift in industrial strategy dictated by a political elite that is in the hands of the next big financial interest. And we will confront that situation again. We will find governments in hock to the big mm -hmm. technology players, to Silicon Valley, to those who want to take over the mobility system and destroy the German car industry. We'll all, we will be confronted by that question of losers and winners. And the, and the politics of that has to be kept forefront 
in our mind. If we, if, we don't, if we are not able to keep that politics in the forefront of, my, of our mind, then I do have a fear about a kind of revolutionary reaction because that will, I mm -hmm. think, in the end, have to happen. There will be enough dissatisfaction out there that people will take that power into their own hands in potentially destructive ways. The more we can give people the power to do things in less destructive ways and to create the change themselves, then the less that danger is. And that's a secondary function to me of the book. It's not to say there's an easy solution here tomorrow, but there are ways of working now that offset that potentially dangerous situation in the future. On the question of culture, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. Actually, I did mention culture yeah, a did. few times. He did. So either Definitely. I was I, I talking <laughs> too fast or in the wrong language or, um, um, or you missed it. Um, but I do think, I absolutely agree with you that, that we're, we're not just talking about economic institutions. We're talking about changes in, in, in culture, changes in social institutions and changes in our own view, actually, of who we are as human beings. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Next round of questions, please. And we take people from the center of the room. Oh. Well, we talked about, you talked about we all the time. Who is we? Who is us? And uh, you mentioned the poorer countries, Ecuador, for instance, and also in Africa, there is this philosophy about the genuine values of uh, mankind, the strive for happiness. And the, the we, that's something that is not yet clearly defined. In your book, you describe the power of investment, that we need to invest In more in time intensive uh, in time intensive activities uh, I mean uh, in, in capitalism there is uh, always uh, this focus on uh, faster and less and less time uh, for work um, but here you focus on slower things who is we you mentioned the poorer countries like Ecuador what are the other countries the other maybe poorer uh, regions that bring about uh, the concepts and philosoph philosophical ones. In 2010, I read your first book, and I was so thrilled. But now, in that new book, I see, or at least in the introduction that you've given today, I've seen no new aspects. My question is, where are the major changes, uh, where are your new aspects, strategies, suggestions? In simple words, uh, is it worthwhile buying your update? And just one more comment regarding winners and losers. If the losers of this process will be the ones that produce material things and distribute them, then we will have a huge social problem. A very comprehensive analysis regarding the winners and losers would be very important because otherwise uh, this project, if we ever implement it, will not be successful. I'm Verena and I study economics. Thanks for this discussion. I do have a question regarding the reproductive work. Uh, production was well discussed, but uh, uh, what I was missing was uh, care work, uh, because care work is very important also in the light of degrowth activities, and why didn't we talk about care at all? And uh, I think my question is, in how far did you uh, f consider care work? What do you do in Vienna in your institute? Do you uh, do any research there? Uh, and also, how about uh, power? Can, shouldn't we distribute 
growth in a better way between the rich and the poor countries. I mean, it is not acceptable that uh, people in the third world are going hungry uh, while we we have a very rich life, so we need to redistribute. I'm Clemens Witter. I come from the DOC Research Institute in Berlin, and I've got a question regarding technological ch uh, change. There's some positive aspects like solar energy and so on and so forth, but there are also other aspects like Amazon and consumerism, Mercedes-Benz, just to name the German companies. How can we shape technological progress in a way that this uh, technological progress becomes sustainable? How can we bring the big transnational corporations on board sustainability? What are your strategies for that? Renewables Academy here in Berlin. And my question is if a country, let's say the UK, decides to adopt a post-growth economy, can it remain competitive with other countries? Or does it even want to remain competitive? My name is Andreas Simonite. I'm the, with Oliver Richters, we are the members of the working group on growth imperatives of the German Society for Ecological Economics. And I would like, uh, our main question is, why can't we stop? That's the question for growth imperatives. And I would like to ask you, what do you think of the thesis mainly put forward by Robert U. Iris and Rainer Kümmel, uh, that technical progress is not a black box, but mainly substitution of expensive work by cheap capital energy combinations, which would spiral the growth dynamics. Dimitri from Free University of Tbilisi, uh, and I want to ask a question. Uh, about if we will take just the ideal world, what do you think? Who should be the first mover who will go to that direction and who, which country should actually start adopting these practices to get the best, best results? Well, I would provide us with uh, food for thought and answers for the next two hours. Andreas, would you like to make a start? Well, indeed, I also believe that the concept of transformation has the potential to combine reform and revolution. The, the first question uh, that uh, our audience asked were very radical, and now we have a set of questions regarding the approaches, the gradual changes that we need. And I think a learning step would be to think radical, to have the grand paradigm shift in mind, but to do these small things at the same time, to go all these uh, small steps that are important, meaningful, and get us on the right track. And so transformation and uh, re revolution uh, would have to be seen in connection in transformation research. Reproductive work, yes, that's one of the central problems of economic theory, that it is defined in such narrow terms. And everything I said about consumerism means that we think economics and leave out all these large areas of unpaid work. There is a reference to that in the book. And of course, it's a question of distribution of labor and uh, working time. It's a very important aspect. Because a reduction of uh, employment is a prerequisite for having more time for different activities, political activities, uh, social community-based activities, and care activities. 
and more equality between uh, the sexes as far as care work is concerned. Well, I already talked about the necessity to take the small steps. The big step then would be full equality. Uh, in Austria, we uh, have less women with full-time employment today compared to the year 1993. So there is even a reduction. The question about the UK and also the question of uh, the first mover. I think that's uh, that's uh, difficult. It's always the question of the hen and the egg. Nobody wants to go first because uh, people would just copy uh, the things that the first mover does. And, and I think that means we have to protect ourselves against unfair competition and find ways and means to make progress without making big mistakes. And uh, of course, our system, as far as uh, its logic is concerned, it's not designed in a way that it promotes good life for everyone. That's the paradoxical thing. This system has made a contribution to improving the life of uh, people indirectly, not because it was the paramount goal, not be and Adam Smith said that, uh, uh, well, everybody tries to make a profit, and that brought prosperity to some. And uh, also, this uh, system produced many negative consequences, and we have to find ways and means to disrupt this dilemma. For that purpose, I think we need more political participation. And you ask about te technological uh, advances. That requires also a political shaping, a political wise governance. And this wise governance doesn't take place because others don't want it. And uh, so we have to find somehow a starting point. And these starting points are mentioned several times in the book. And of course, that includes the option of changing relationships of power in a radical way. So it might be a question of keeping the big, large corporations at bay. It's not so much giving them more incentives to be more sustainable. It's rather stopping them and imposing clear-cut boundaries. Tim, over to you. Now you have to convince the, the person who wanted to know, is it worthwhile buying your update? And then I'd like to come back to what you said, the person in the audience. Let me leave my role as facilitator just for a moment. If we have to rethink the economy, where we have our planetary boundaries and social inequalities, if we want to, or if you have to rethink the economy, we have to do it because the economic theory, as Andreas has said, completely leaves out reproductive labor. It's always a labor that is unpaid, that is marginalized, that is seen just as a social asset, as something to be done by women. And that is why it really makes me angry, uh, because there is f feminists economist theory. And unfortunately, the uh, work of uh, feminist economists is not duly taken into account, uh, not even uh, in left-wing circles. So that is why. Uh, let's see what you're doing there, what, what your opinion is, Tim. 
I mean, so many questions, so, so, so much there. I mean, let me come to the question of the, of the UK first and the question of unilateral going for degrowth. I think we've done it. I think, we, you know, Brexit is it. That's our claim. That's where <laughs> we, it's, it's really unfortunate that we're going to end up with a trashed economy and no friends at all. But there it is. You know, if you make that kind of choice, what can you expect? Um, it, 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 it was a first mover disadvantage, maybe. I don't know. But, it, but, it, but it's, a, you know, the legitimate question is, of course, it's tricky at the individual nation state, but there are still places where you can make those changes. And, and I think you know, it goes a little bit to that question of who is the we, are there places where countries that do make those changes actually, yes, they have in some degree. So there's more financial stability in, in a country like Japan that's had virtually no growth and 200% debt to GDP ratio. And that's a function of the kind of society they have and the kind of economy they have and the, the, the way in which they've structured debt. Are there places where you have more of an economy of care? And I want to come back to that. And there absolutely are in the Scandinavian economies in particular, um, where there's also a different culture about that and not just um, making it clear that, that women and women's work um, should be properly remunerated, but actually opening up the space for men to do something different as well and to participate more in that reproductive work. So there are, there are these cultures. The culture of Buen Vivir in Ecuador that I've already mentioned, the culture after Prosperity Without Growth was first published, someone from South Africa wrote to me and said, actually, this is the concept of Ubuntu. This is a cultural uh -huh. concept that we know from the beginning about uh, I, my prosperity hangs on your prosperity. It's a shared sense of a prosperity. So there are all of those cultural examples um, of places where we could do things differently where countries have done things differently and where those models of change exist. I wanted to come to the point about, about the super, supranationals and, and, and Adam Smith, and in particular the kind of Adam Smith, the argument that actually Ad, you know, Adam Smith is saying it's from the self-interest of the butcher, the baker, um, that, that we get social good. Adam Smith saw that in a very particular context where he was absolutely not saying uh, it's from profit making and selfishness. He was saying in part that those are motives that drive people, but he was also saying that social solidarity and our concern for other people's view of us is an absolutely critical moderator on that. It stops us exploiting people. It stops us running away with the common good. It stops us free riding because in those circumstances, the ones that he was talking about, competition is finely balanced with collaboration and with solidarity and with a sense of social cohesion. He was absolutely adamant about your last point, really, that when you get big corporations with big power, they are not operating in the interest of the social good. And the only way way to, to stop that power becoming destructive in society is, is for big government. And that's a very little known part of Adam Smith's political philosophy, but basically he's, it was absolutely saying that when you get big accumulated power, you, the only way to stop it is through big government and, and the government that intervenes to break up that power. That doesn't mean, I think, that you don't work inside those big corporations wherever you can, because there are bright visionary people with a clear view of the future who are persuadable actually that a, a destructive well it may be persuadable at least it's an effort that is worth engaging in and my i suppose my philosophy is generally that there are people everywhere that it's worth engaging with and some very visionary people in those business environments who actually see coming down the line all of the problems that we're talking about and, and know from their own instincts that things have to change. Not all of them are motivated in the social interest at all times, it has to be said. Um, and, and so our strategy of engagement must never stand in the way of a strategy of confronting that form of power where it becomes socially abusive. On the energy thesis, um, I, I do think it's an interesting thing. Um, I absolutely see that a part of the dynamic that we're looking at at the moment actually um, is the beginning of the end of that 
growth potential that arrived from substituting um, increasing energy and resources for, for labor um, in, in the economic model. And I think the declining energy return on investment, the scarce, the increasing scarcity that's going to come through the resource side of the equation is beginning to have an impact on the political mind. I and mean, I know for sure that actually those conversations are now happening inside government. You know, what if there is a declining energy return on investment? Is this a part of our productivity puzzle? Is this a part of why we can't keep that model going in the way that we thought we could before? Is it the end of growth? Is it the end of that spiral dynamic, which has us increasing growth just to keep that substitution going? Those are all the, the easy questions to answer. The, tr the tricky ones and the ones I think that, that, um, that I'd like to just touch on very briefly, if I do have the time, um, you, you challenged me to say what was, what was there was a challenge, who, who is we and, and you know, who is it? I, I think that's a decent challenge. I mean, I tend, if I can avoid it, not to use that. I don't think I used it too much in the book. I did talk about the different places where different kinds of changes could and should occur. And, and one of those changes, to answer the question about what's new, was very much to say how do we, I, I think one of the things I tried to do was to say more specifically how we try, what we need to do uh, to create an economy that works. So we know the diagnosis, we know the limits of decoupling, um, we know that there's a dilemma of growth, we know there are power imbalances. How could we begin to build this new economy? And there my strategy was essentially to take four foundations, four very economic foundations. So the idea of enterprise, the idea of work, the idea of investment, and the idea of money, the money system itself. And actually to say these have become destructive in our economy, but actually are critical parts, they're critical foundations for the economy of tomorrow. And to, and to actually put forward a very specific vision, examples, and strategies for achieving that transformation, to, to think, first of all, as of enterprise, that it isn't just a profit-maximizing division of labor that creates mass production uh, with enormous environmental impact. It is about service. It's about, about people in the service of others. And, and when you take that concept of enterprise, you begin to be drawn towards exactly what the question the lady over here was asking about the reproductive economy. Because when you ask what those questions are, they are the reproductive activities of care, of, of social care, of health, of education, of participation. And these are the places that are absolutely the places where there, there is employment potential, where there is the ability to reward people for working in the service of others. And that's a, that's a fundamental reconception of how we think about service and how we think about enterprise in the economy. I haven't got time to go through all of it. Okay. It's in the you book. You have but still to work for a final round. Okay, thank you so much, Tim. So, es ist dieser Block dran. Das sind noch ja, perfekt. Uh, so, three questions, perfect. So, the lady in the back, then in the middle and in the front. Ina Kreische, Berliner Bürgerin, I'm a citizen of Berlin. Well, my first question goes to Andreas. Uh, unfortunately, I forgot your surname, Novi. Okay, Novi, Andreas Novi. Question to you. Um, in your contribution, you mentioned social transformation and also the red Vienna model, which was a plan there, or oh, I did not fully understand it, the, the wages were not supposed to rise. Um, um, I'm sorry, but um, immediately a critical question came up to me. Why are you thinking about the uh, lack of rise in the wages, whereas the uh, profits of the uh, employers are not taken into account. Well, we can uh, clear this up very quickly. You talked about the 1930s when there were no real wage increases. So this was a fact. And based on this fact, people came together, founded some um, association, and developed this social infrastructure. OK, well, then um, I would like to um, submit a comment. In the current situation, 
I would not only like to uh, see care work included in the debate, but also the uh, industrialized nations as the successors of the colonial powers. They continue to uh, recklessly exploit people there and the natural resources for economic reasons. And um, we all know that. And last but not least, the uh, destruction of the uh, diversity, biological diversity, which I think is even more important than the issue of the climate. Thank you. Here in the middle. My name is Pia, I'm a student, and uh, my question is a follow-up question to the debate on the limits of the capitalist system, but also refers to what Andreas has mentioned earlier. Um, you mentioned the competition within the system and the production need, um, the idea of a basic income, uh, unconditional basic income. I'm not um, a, a champion of it, but I'm weighing the, the um, advantages and disadvantages. And from my point of view, it would only make sense at a global level. But I would like to ask you concerning the concept, what might be the, the implications of that or the change achieved by that um, if we would see more solidarity and less competition? and what would that mean for the market? What would be the implications for the market when people are no longer dependent on uh, producing things and uh, undertake um, work that makes sense to them? And now the last question. My question is the following. You talked about growth, but I was missing the population growth. Does the author of this book mean that prosperity without population growth? Or how, how do you consider growth? Growth without population growth? Or what do you think? Well, so now there are three further questions. And I would like to ask the two of you to, first of all, to answer the questions or also to comment the questions if you wish, and then to give a final statement, a short statement, because we are coming to the end of this uh, very nice event. Do you want to include the last question here from the gentleman in the back? Thank you very much. Lino Celios, I'm an economist and also activist, and I have a question concerning the monetary system. At the beginning, you mentioned the dilemma of growth and stagnation and recession. And I think that a major problem is the fiscal system or the question of how money is uh, emerging as a bank loan that needs to, um, or where we see interest. And I think, um, or I would like to know from you, how important do you consider the fiscal system and how about reforms? What would you think about reforms to the fiscal system and the monetary system? Thank you very much. This is a very important question which is also being addressed in the book because one of the updates after 2009 was the financial crisis and its effects and um, how it hinders us to come to prosperity. Andreas, well, I think it is very important you can also discuss this um, model. The fact that we are very far away from it, that money is being produced um, privately also beyond the banking system and to once again get hold of this, this whole shadow banking system, etc. I think would be a first step before we uh, can talk about many other things. So that's my brief statement uh, on your question. Well, my final statement evolves around the unconditional basic income, because here I can show that there are very many aspects 
why I think that it is not the um, large utopia um, as many people think. In Austria, we have two large experiments of money transfer for large groups in society, which is not an unconditional transfer, but for all those who have um, incapabilities, they get a basic income uh, as some kind of child, or similar to the child allowances. It is a substantial one. Concerning the care allowances, it depends on the degree of um, of disability and concerning the child allowances it starts uh, with 500 euros and goes 600 euros and goes up so it's quite a lot and everyone is entitled to get it and in both cases you see and this is very decisive for the reproduction process it reproduces uh, gender relationships um, in the care we have wives and the the stem, uh, daughters in law and um, and this reinforces uh, gender roles if you organize a money transfer if you take a look at the Scandinavian model that you mentioned as a positive uh, model and build up infrastructures, then you have the possibility through child care facilities and also uh, care facilities to create a model that is a more general model and where the we have not um, a real gender balance, but um, we neither have a major imbalance here in this regard. and. The focus in the reproduction work, the focus on infrastructures has a huge potential to rethink a good life and to get away from the focus on um, uh, money. And the unconditional um, basic income is also one of those ideas. I would like to leave it at that. Tim, last Tim, last questions, opening up new big issues. Well, it's that time in the evening where we should really start to talk about macroeconomics because I know how much you all love it, um, <laughs> and how much brain power we all have, me included, after after a, a quite a long day. But actually, it, it is a part of the challenge that faces us. That the bits of the the new bits of the book in terms of talking about economy, enterprise, enterprise as service, work, work as participation, that important element of prosperity that allows us to participate and to be, to some extent, yes, self-determination. Um, investment, not as a kind of gambling casino where you crash economic markets and financial markets and the public purse pays out for decades for the follies of a minority, but investment as a commitment to the future. What do those institutions look like? Those are some of the questions I've tried to tease out. And money, yes not as a form of dominance and power, but as a social good. And to point to the money system and say that this money system is deeply unequal, has created huge instability, and cannot be the basis for a future prosperity. So I absolutely applaud that point about the money system. It is in the book. Unfortunately, it's never going to be enough entirely to just put those things on the table, just like it's never going to be enough entirely to know that there are these wonderful examples, the, the example that you were pointing to in Red Vienna, the examples that we've talked about this evening um, in all sorts of ways, small social experiments, bigger social experiments, even the basic income actually is never going to be enough. I've actually recently done a bit of work on the basic income. I do think it's a, a potentially useful idea. But the one thing that I discovered from macroeconomics um, is actually that it can only take you so far. 
And the other thing that I discovered from macroeconomics is actually this entire story that we need growth for stability is completely wrong. Actually, this growth-based vision has driven instability. It's undermined the integrity of financial markets. It's made the public pay out for decades for the follies of people who have enriched themselves. The privatization of benefits and the socialization of losses is the defining story of the capitalism of the last century or more. And we have to build an economy that does better than that. The one really surprising thing that we are now beginning to discover through a macroeconomics of the post-growth economy is actually that this descent to a more stable economy, a less growth-based economy, brings with it, if we get the conditions right, real benefits in terms of stability. It brings real benefits in terms of inequality, the reduction in inequality. It brings real benefits in terms of the kind of work that would increase and enhance the reproductive economy and minimize our damage to the planet. What I'm saying to you here is there's an economics of hope, a macroeconomics of hope. The foundation of the word prosperity in English is the idea of hope. And working for that hope, to me, is still a worthwhile task. It's a, start, a task that didn't stop with the first edition, it won't stop with the second edition. I'm not promising a third edition, um, but if there is one, I'd be happy to come the here to Berlin. Or something and, like that doesn't yeah, exist. Just re-update. <laughs> very schön, very ganz schön. And, and I'd just like to thank you all again for supporting that endeavor, that inquiry, that sense of hope about changing the economy, to create an economy that works for everyone. Woo! Yeah, ganz, ganz. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you very much to Andreas and Tim for an evening that was hopefully very inspiring, that has brought up ideas and that has made you think uh, this is what we wanted. And of course, you can buy the book outside. And you can read about many aspects that we've dealt with here today. I would also like to thank some people who have contributed to the success of this evening, which is the uh, uh, office, of course, the technicians and our translators or interpreters. <laughs> and thank you very much for that. And I would like to invite you now to a snack and also beverage. And we will stay here. Andreas and Tim will stay here. So uh, you can seize the opportunity for a nice summer evening. And all the best. And thank you very much to you.